They are putting this event together. We, I think it's called We Love You, Israel. Michael Rappaport, the American actor. Then this British guy who wrote the Borat screenplay. So, hello, I'm here with Michael Rappaport. I'm here with Lee Kern. We are in Israel. Monday night, we're doing something for the love of Israel because we, can we say f no, the, the event, we're putting on a special event just for you. It's called Israel, we f love you. Douglas Murray was there. So let's take a look at this panel that that features also, as we'll learn, an Israeli psychotherapist and listen to what they have to say about what's happening in Gaza. And I want to say something. I, I kind of listen to everybody, and I, I, I don't know if this is the question you want to ask me, but I, I listen to all of you, and everybody's talking about the hostages, and absolutely, they have to come back, all of them. Uh, however, this is not the end. The fact that the hostages are going to come... It's, it's not going to end something. It's going to just going to be the beginning of us taking care of this because we are not, I am not okay with living across the border of 20 or 30,000 rapists. I'm sorry. Are you? I'm done. They have proven themselves to be, you know, to, to, to not be, you know, fully intact. Okay. And we, you know, Leah and I had a conversation about it. I feel yeah. like these are all mostly sociopaths. Psychopaths are born, sociopaths, sociopaths so sorry, are Ayanna made. Is, can you tell people what you actually, your professional right, qualifications Right, so I am a, a, I am a psychotherapist and a licensed clinical social worker. I do psychotherapy. Um, I've done it for a living uh, for a long time. And uh, I have to say, when you talk about psychopaths, psychopaths are born, okay? And it's a very small percentage in the population. Sociopaths are made. And I live across the border with a lovely place in a lovely town where they are made daily and it's time for us to stand up for it and say enough enough is enough i am not interested and i have to tell you and i'm going to speak american for a second when i used to live in the u.s um every time i would move to a different place i would look in the map and see if there are any pedophiles or sex offenders around me right in a radius of i don't know five miles ten miles where i live in like three miles away from twenty thousand of them and I'm not okay with it, and I don't think I'm safe, and I don't think my kid is safe, and enough is enough, and never again means never again. When, um, so, I know, without, we, we're not going to talk about any details or stuff. I, I know that Michael saw that 47-minute film um, the other day, and I saw it as well. And when it was, I mean, amongst the many reactions I had, it, as someone who was in a safe room watching it and it affected me deeply even though I was physically safe. So I can only imagine what it's like for the people who've been directly in these situations, what they'll have to get over with. But just one weird response was I spent a week just saying, I don't understand what I saw. Like almost like a little boy saying, I don't, I don't understand it. What, I don't, what happened? I don't understand. And I couldn't understand. And then sort of about a week and a bit later, it just clocked in my head and it's something that you can speak of, I'm sure, where I thought, oh, it's actually really simple, because I, I saw these people at the end of their journey. To actually know how they got there, you need to go right to, back to the beginning. And so when people sometimes ask me, oh, when do you think October 7th was planned? How long for? A year? Like two years? And my answer is, take the age of the oldest person who took part in it, and it started the day they were born. Where if all you put in a baby's head is racism and hate, and desensitize them to violence, but more than that, glorify violence and tell them that the closest way they can get to God is through violence and dying. What the fuck do you think you're gonna get out of the end of it, you know? Listen, I have to tell you, one of the things that I say to people all the time is that we fight because we love. We love, we love our country, we love our kids. We fight because we love. We have to defend the things that we love. They fight because they hate. And they're being indoctr indoctrinated, is that how you say it? You know, since they're babies. And I'm sick and tired of the fact that no one is uh, holding them accountable for it. They need to be accountable for it. That's the creating it. You know, and this point, one plus one is two. Enough with the excuses. Enough with the accusations. You want to see what's wrong with you? Look in the freaking mirror. Like, enough is enough. What you yeah. I would say I would agree with two points that were made since we should try to find as uh, 
what's that guy in NPR? Brian Lehrer always wants to find common, common ground. ground right. There is a concentration camp guard. Here is an inmate of a concentration camp. Let's see if we can find some common ground. So in that NPR spirit, I'll say I agree with two statements. Statement number one, yes, it's true. Take the oldest person who burst the gates of Gaza on October 7th and go back to the day he was born. And that's when it all started. I, I agree with that. Actually, that fellow on the stole a line from me. I said that to understand those guys, you have to remember that they were born into a concentration camp. You have to remember that they were periodically subjected to Israel's mowings of the lawn. You have to remember that they were never able to go in, go out, never leave. You have to remember that, that they were kept on a starvation plus diet. You have to remember that they tried nonviolence in 2018 and Israel targeted, according to the international human rights organizations, targeted children, targeted journalists, targeted medical personnel, targeted people with physical disabilities. You'll have to remember that Israel, the snipers, targeted the kneecap and below in order to cause life-changing injuries to them, leaving them, to use the impolite language, cripples for life. And also not letting them get the operations that they would have needed to not have amputations. 900 people died in Gaza because they weren't allowed to leave to get that medical treatment. Have died because they weren't allowed to receive that medical treatment. So I, I um, agree with that, totally. And I agree with her statement. She said, it's time for people to look themselves in the mirror. I think that's very good advice. It's time to look yourself in the mirror. Do you remember those angelic Israeli children in the choir singing, we're going to annihilate Gaza? think stuff like that. I really don't. Not in public. It didn't happen in Nazi Germany. They might talk about in sort of like broad terms, the Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracy. But to say, we are going to annihilate, well, no, 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 they did say we'll annihilate the Jews. No, they did say that. So that, that was, but you wouldn't have Not seen in videos, maybe. You wouldn't see an angelic kids doing that. You know, I don't think so. I, 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 there was a period where I knew all this literature, and I think I wrote quite effectively on the subject of Nazi Holocaust, if I can tune my own horn. Uh, but now I've forgotten that was uh, another period in my life. But what does that say about the society? These angelic children singing a chorus, we're going to annihilate Gaza. Yes, look in the mirror. I think that's good advice. Uh -huh. As for the rest. I mean, she keeps saying enough. I'm sick of it. As if Israel isn't engaging in a gen as if Israel's sitting on its hands yeah. and not engaging as in a genocide as, right now. As nobody as if uh, uh nobody condemned October yeah. 7th. I mean the, the degree of narcissism. Uh, and saying never again and never yeah. again. Uh, so those are my random thoughts yeah. on that rather sad episode in the annals of public 
uh, conversation. I, well, it, does, it does sometimes cause me to wonder whether at least uh, some of the folks on stage aren't thinking, well, not sure if I really agree with that. Okay, she says there are 20 to 30,000 rapists in Gaza. So what well, take us to the next step. Should we have a commando, uh, commando raid and kill them, or should we wipe out Gaza? It was unclear to me right. what she saw as the next step. She said, I felt uncomfortable. I felt uncomfortable living next door to those people who are rapists. And I thought to myself, well, you know what, young lady, though she's not so young, but you know what, young lady, I would feel uncomfortable living down the block from a concentration camp. I would have a very queasy feeling about that. But they don't even, they don't even see it. You know, they can't even conceive it. Uh, the idea that there might be something wrong with that. They know it. But we have to admit, you know, I don't want to become off as too harsh on those powerfully deranged people in Israel. But everybody learns to accommodate realities which are wretched. I live in New York. Now, you know, in New York, half the new buildings that go up are empty. They're just investments for Arab sheikhs, Russian oligarchs, Chinese billionaires. They're empty. And then we have all these homeless people. We've all Home learned. oligarchs too. American oligarchs right. also, yeah. Uh, my friend lives at uh, 57 West 57th Street, right out around the corner from Carnegie Hall. And he bought an apartment for $40 million. Okay. And you know what he calls the building? He calls it the mausoleum. Because I've never seen anybody in this building. Right, of course. <laughs> And when we have 30,000 homeless people, well, how do you think history is going to look back on that? So when I say the Israelis accommodate themselves to living next door to a concentration camp, mm -hmm. but the thing is, when it's somebody else, we're always shocked. So if you watch uh, Cloud Lanzman's uh, show up, he has these Poles and others who live right next door at the concentration camps. And I said, what did you think? You knew something terrible was happening. What did you think? And of course, they look terrible. But how about if we ask Israelis the same thing? What do you think living next door to a concentration camp? What do you think? But I also believe, as I said, you can also ask how is a New Yorker, how do you reconcile all these homeless people when half these buildings are empty? So you know about seeing the plank in your eye yeah. before you see the splinter in somebody else's eye. So we should all abide by that uh, principle. But you know, this but one also. is the, the, the level of Blindness is really, I have to say, uh, to appropriate uh, Mr. Harris, it really is uh, powerfully <laughs> deranged. Yeah. I don't like to live next to the Goyim. I think we should kill all of them. And I really do think that for some, a lot of Israel's defenders, anything they do short of what the Nazis did is okay. It's almost like people should be grateful because you've hear, heard people say, trust us, if we wanted to kill them all, we would. Well, that's not, there, there's a certain amount of um, disingenuousness in that claim because you have to remember <clears throat> the Nazis couldn't do what they wanted to do in any situation. Right. They, uh, first of all, they couldn't do it in broad daylight in peacetime. Hitler may have made the threats, but he always made the threats within the context of if there is a war. Because it's forgotten when the Nazis carried out Kristallnacht, the German public opinion was overwhelmingly against it. Now, partly it was because 
they didn't think that was the right thing to do, the Jews, and partly because they felt it was beneath German civilization. You don't go break, go around breaking glasses in synagogues. That's riffraff and ruffians who do that. And civilized Germans, Germany was the peak of European culture. Uh, civilized Ger Germans don't do it. So Hitler couldn't have done it in broad daylight. He needed a war situation and he needed the hysteria of the Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracy to destroy Germany. Uh, and he needed totalitarianism. They couldn't hear anything else except that message. So there were conditions. Now, I think Israel would have used if it had the option. After October 7th, Israel was in a bloodlust, total deranged state. You could say, I understand it. Okay, fine. Uh, they would have used, they would have nuked Gaza if they could. But there is an international community that imposes constraints. So when they say, well, and Israel has nukes, it could have just nuked them. No, it couldn't. Not because they don't want to. As we know, one of their ministers said, we should nuke Gaza. And then they said, all right, this is pretty embarrassing. Got to shut this guy up. Uh, so they're thinking it just like this woman here. Yeah. As far as I can understand, the logical conclusion of I don't live, like to live near 40,000 rapists was we have to uh, wipe out Gaza. So, but there's a difference between what you would like to do and what under the constraints of the international community, public opinion, all that you can do. Yeah. But we have to give some credit to Israel. It's gone pretty far. Every single metric you look at, every metric you look at, you look at the metric of the intensity of the bombing, you look at the metric of the uh, imprecision of the bombs, you look at the metric of the weight of the bombs, you look at the metric of uh, civilian infrastructure destroyed, you look at the metric of women and children versus men killed, you look at the metric of number of children killed relatively and absolutely, and every single me metric, Israel's off the map. It's just in a totally different uh, totally different category than any other war in the 20th century. And actually, it's in a different category as compared to war, uh, even World War II. When you look at the amount of physical damage that was done, now remember the US and the UK were engaging in terror bombing. They called it carpet bombing or strategic bombing, but they were terror bombing the cities. You still didn't have that level of destruction. You didn't have, you just didn't, you didn't have. The, the Financial Times, reported a few, around a week ago, it said that northern, uh, northern, Israel, northern Gaza is not uninhabitable. There's nothing there, it's been leveled. Whole cities are gone. Beit Hanun no longer exists, it's gone. It's just been, uh, our terror bombing did not achieve that level of, you know, percentage-wise of uh, destruction. So even though they haven't nuked Gaza, you have to say they've accumulated a very impressive record. Have accumulated a very impressive record.
So, hello, I'm here with Michael Rappaport. I'm here with Lee Kern. We are in Israel. Monday night, we're doing something for the love of Israel because we... Can we say fuck you? Yeah, no, the, the event, we're putting on a special event just for you. It's called Israel, we fucking love you. 